All right, it's the new flu review coming right at you. Welcome to Doozer Shop. Um, gonna give you an update. Uh, strange times. Been spending time here out in the shop. Um, I've been working. I'm one of the only mechanical engineers coming in uh, for work. Uh, by request, um, I do a lot of different things uh, at work, and uh, I guess I'm covering a lot of bases, so <clears throat> they need me there. But I'm being very careful, uh, wearing gloves and not touching too many things, and not touching doorknobs and, and whatever. So we'll see. Trying to stay healthy. And, uh, yeah. Let's not talk about that. Everybody's talking about it. Um, let me show you some eBay purchases. One eBay purchase. I'll go handheld and I'll give you an update on the Colchester lathe, what I've been working on with that. So first of all, there's the box. And on top of the packing material, I was greeted with something that was not uh, in the auction. Let's see here. Um, Uh, a machinist scale. Pretty darn awesome one at that. Um, yeah, PEC tools. Yeah, beautiful six inch scale. Um, I said it was not in the auction. It was, uh, you know, as a bonus, it was on top. So, um, what I did purchase is this four jaw chuck. Um, four inch diameter, four jaw, and uh, let me show you, it's got a 5C shank on it. For all you uh, 5C shank lovers out there. Elgin Tool Works. So that's pretty cool. For those of you that don't know, Elgin was started uh, by the, uh, I believe, one of the Harding brothers, Ooh. and uh, yeah, one of the Harding brothers. When Harding went from Chicago to, uh, I guess it was Ravenswood Avenue, Chicago to Elmira, New York. Um, they had the collet business in Elmira. They purchased a a wire chuck company or collet company, and uh, the employees left from the Harding Lathe Works in uh, Chicago. I guess one of the Harding brothers started uh, Elgin about 1930, from what I uh, have researched. So this uh, chuck here is a Union. Union Manufacturing, New Britain, Connecticut, right? So that, uh, the Elgin and the Union kind of date it. So I would say that this is probably between 1930 and maybe 1950. Something like that. Not actually as far as Elgin, I don't know when they ceased operation. But anyways, this is a, uh, a beautiful chuck. I believe it was uh, either not ever used or uh, hardly ever used. This is just some number. And uh, it's in fine shape. All the jaws are just very tight. Um, I did not film it. I was going to do an unboxing video, but you know, I says, for what it's worth, I'm going to clean this up um, and just shoot a video after. I cleaned this, uh, I took all the uh, jaws out, and I uh, cleaned it all in uh, the parts tank. And predominantly, you know, it was in the condition you see other than gunge and grunge from being on the shelf. 
Um, very few metal chips in it, maybe one or two. But uh, there's no scarring on the jaws, no splaying on the jaws. Um, so these are Allen heads, Allen head uh, cap screws. And it's hard to see. Uh, let's see. They're, uh, they're domed over. Yeah, so somebody actually took the time and, and gave it a, uh, a dome polish. I don't know, but uh, even the threads are in fine condition, and the uh, the key seat there. But it's cool. So Elgin Tool Works, five uh, C shank. Oh, the um, in the Union Chuck. The square drives for the uh, Chuck jaw. Pinions are. I uh, thought that was quarter inch. It's not. It's uh, 0.218, seconds of an inch. So I gotta make up a Chuck key wrench for that. So uh, yeah, pretty skookum on this uh, Chuck deal there. Like sixty-seven dollars I paid uh, on the old eBay, and I knew from the picture. I could just tell it was shiny and crisp on the face enough where I could say it was never rusted, uh, at least not heavily. And uh, I don't know how well it shows up in this video, but it just, you could kind of tell, even though it was greasy, it was a diamond in the rough. Uh, it, it was just gleaming with virgin um, machine surfaces underneath the rust. Uh, I'm sorry, underneath the, the grunge. wasn't really rusty at all. So uh, I took a chance, and there you go. Alright, so there's that. And it came with uh, a uh, Harding uh, center. Live center for, with the 5C. Um... So that's handy. I think I only had one of those. And it's nice, it's got uh, the straight part of that. That's all solid. That's not a, not a tape or nothing. You can put your do driver dogs on there for uh, whatever. And just so I'll show you guys, aside from putting it in uh, the, the Sagami lathe or the Harding lathe, it's good for fixtures. You know, index fixtures, uh, whatever. So uh, that's, that's, you want to capture something in a spin jig or a super spacer and uh, it's bigger than a, a Harding Collet uh, will hold it. So I'm zooming in on a Covell cylindrical grinder and uh, I don't know if I've showed this in many videos. So the workhead spindle is uh, Man, I'm getting the, and the lighting's poor. So that's 5C um, in the uh, workhead, headstock, workhead, whatever you want to call it. So that's this grinder is a 5C machine. Uh, belt drive reduction, like I said, I got the belts in the the pulley, um, the belt guard off there. But uh, the only 5C um, other than collets accessory for this, I have a four inch Chinese three jaw. And three jaws are only so accurate, especially on a grinder, they're not accurate enough on a cylindrical grinder. So that's kind of uh, the primary reason for getting that chuck is to use it on, on here. Now, I know this is the ultimate sidebar. I was not grinding that um, shaft, that was just uh, showing somebody um, about how between centers um, grinding works. So I'm gonna I have another headstock for this brown and sharp 13 grinder and that's a number seven brown and sharp taper and that's a uh, the face plate it's to screw on with a left hand threaded chuck spindle nose 
And Brian Sharp has used that mounting since the 1890s, 1880s, and they never they never changed it. And this is actually a pulley. It looks like a faceplate, but the the belt goes around there. Um, but so if you look behind it, you might have caught a glimpse. Um, that uh, magnetic chuck fits the uh, the headstock of the Brown and Sharp 13. So that fits. That fits. See, this one is about what I had um, purchased. Click the light on. This is a buck chuck. Um, I think Maine, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yeah, this this is a buck. And you know, Jesus, I'm not gonna pick it up with one hand. But um, they're heavy. So let me show you. All right, for you guys that haven't seen, um, this is a grinding chuck. And it's kind of sealed. All right, I flipped it over prematurely. Um, so, uh, this is a steel ring. The bore does not open up. Let me steady myself here and I'll get you zoom. Alright. So you can see the threads for mounting it to the spindle. But these jaws do not break through into the bore. Okay? Most four jaw chucks, like, well, that one does. You can't see it so well. Yeah. So, um, so this, this chuck, you can see the pinions, they break into the central bore. <laughs> And that's uh, predominantly where the, the, the grit um, ends up, you know, going in that area. Let me zoom in. You can see the slots come right to the center. And that's where a lot of your grit and nastiness uh, ends up, right? But uh, on this chuck, and this is actually, a, I believe it's a Skinner. Skinner Chuck, also in New Britain. So I wonder if Union and Skinner were across the street from each other, and or what? But anyways, as you can see, and I know the photography is. Uh, It just, they don't come through, you see. They don't break through. So that's a grinder chuck. But anyways, so. Um, this is like the face plate. And it's actually, this is a pulley surface for a flat belt. And there is a flat belt inside. So there's a, uh, a straight register portion of the spindle and then there's threads. That's how that works. And you screw it on and you put the belt around it. You know? And uh... That's what it is. There's the, the flat belt. And that's uh... It's got the faceplate driver on there now. But, anyhow, that's how that works. Um... All right, the star of the show. Um, the apron. Uh, all right, this is gonna be complicated. So I've got the feed rod, as you can see, in the apron. And I didn't have a short piece of inch and a quarter 
stock as a dummy. So I put the whole big long shooting match in there and I got it uh, shimmed in position. And uh, I've learned a few things. Yeah. So, um, kind of frame you here. So that's the uh, the rocker box mechanism, and it's installed meshing with uh, a crossfeed, I believe. So the way this works is you got your uh, your disengagement lever, and uh, if you if you pull it up, well, it's upside down, so. It uh, that detent is not snapped in. Um, you can kind of see um, it's a big plunger detent, and there's a recess in this slot. So this is a slot, and there's a uh, a recess in there. Oh, duh. This is what it is. So there's the slot for the handle, and that is a board uh, recess for the detent to snap into hypnotizing slow motion. And that's all in cast iron. The apron wall is obviously cast iron. So let me do this. So that compresses that. There's supposed to be a spring in there. I don't remember if I left the spring in there or not. And it lifts up and it's supposed to go over to this one and transition. So it's not snapping <clears throat> no, not snapping in. Or it did snap it snapped in a little. It's it's not snapping in fully, but that's the worm gear on that shaft where the blue is. That's the worm gear, and it meshes with that gear, or it meshes with this gear. So this gear, that's the the cross feed. So the thing is. If you really push on that detent and make it pop in, the 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 worm gear is um, super tight in the mesh of the uh, of these gears. So I guess that's a worm, and this is a worm wheel. I don't know what the terminology is uh, per se. So. In order for uh, get a good so when that big plunger that that the plunger is inch and an eighth diameter so when that snaps in there um it holds it too far down right it's got a hold it a little further up. So what I'm going to show you I think I think this does it goes back way too far um, because there's no feed stop bracket on it. So let me kinda yeah actually going on the other side maybe I can lean a little better not trip over everything that's on the floor. Not push any buttons that I don't want to push on the camcorder. Right. So, so like I said, the power feed comes in and spins that um, then that uh, worm will mesh either on that one for the longitudinal feed or that one for the cross feet, okay? 
you can see really good you can see uh, the detent so I know I'm standing on my head here so the way this works so there's the handle and like I said this this is way further back than it normally would be um, let's see Mm -hmm. Oh, it wasn't even tight. Okay. All right. All right. So So that's what that handle looks like. Comes out of there. So that's that handle. I'm going to set that on the bench. So so this dude here and there's the pin just kind of hanging out. I'm going to try and different springs in it. You pop the springs out. Whatever. Um, so it sits in this bore, and I measured the bore. It is inch um, point one four zero, and this is like inch point one two zero. Um, so it's sloppy. Even if you do it this way, right? It's got like twenty thousandths of slop. So the deal is, I think I need to take some uh, of the diameter off of that, right? So what will end up happening? See how that pops in there, you know? It'll be actually, right now it's, it goes in, it just starts a little bit. And it's already hanging up on the, the, the gear clearance is, is too tight. But I need it to pop in, in that one, or like I said, in that one. So I was gonna turn some off the, the, the nose diameter. So instead of sitting up here, it'll be a, a little smaller, and it, it'll, it'll pop in, and the gear mesh um, will not be so severe. Actually, that's a good shot. So there's the worm. That worm meshes with that or that for the power feed. So and this this is uh, spinning from your feed rod, and uh, I don't have the. I don't have the gear in there, but there's a, a power takeoff gear that goes, you know, and mates with the keyway and spins that. But you've seen that before. So the gear goes on there, it's not on there now, but and this spins the worm, and then the worm is gonna mesh with that gear or that gear. So that's the new gear, that's the old gear. So that's for the, the cross feed, right? That's cool. And if you spin this one. That spins the uh, well, the input handles at spline, right? That's 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 that red handle, um, and then on the other side, well, it's not the is the pinion, right? That drives the the rack on the lathe bed under the lathe bed. Okay, so again, I, what I need to do. Is, is, is turn a step on this so it fits in there um, so it clicks in without just almost clicking in and gives me my clearance back so it doesn't swing so hard into uh, the position that it detents into 
So I got talking to uh, one of my friends on the phone describing this and I'm um, kind of making the video to um, give him a better idea. So this is actually somewhat hard piece of steel. And I guess it's to resist the wear of that edge. But I was going to initially sleeve this with bronze on the back. Um, to tighten it up in the bore because you can see when it's engaged it sits about there right it sticks out just a little but you know that's and that slop is favoring helping the the teeth not mesh so hard but I still don't like how sloppy it is so it should be tighter in the bore but looser at the nose and like I said that's why I got the layout ink on there I scribed a line just to see where my surfaces uh, made it up. So it looks like I was going to sleeve this with bronze, and I got a I got a piece of bronze there I was going to use. I, um, but my uh, my friend said, "Why don't you just make the whole thing out of bronze?" I got I got I got a little bit um, of this. Uh, this is uh, nine fifty four bronze inch and five-eighths diameter. So I got, I've got a couple sticks of this uh, that I didn't have to buy. And uh, too bad it needs to be a little longer than that. But I've got plenty of this aluminum bronze. So I might as well just make this out of aluminum bronze. And that way I'm not messing around with uh, carbide trying to cut hardened steel. Well, I kind of use carbide. You know, in a lot of my tooling regardless but then, uh, like I said, and bronze would just be easier to make it out of bronze than sleeve this and press fit it or Loctite fit it on there. Um, so thank you, Jim. I think I will make it out of bronze. And I will make it fit the bore tighter. And I will step it towards the front so it... Uh, actually is a little smaller diameter and that's why this is up on the bench folks I'm, I'm test fitting this so now that the bushings are so tight and is there a misalignment problem that the gears mesh so tight I don't know I don't think so um, but there's been a lot of things done to this rocker box okay this piece, you can see, I know, I'm kind of backwards. There's two uh, screws there, and there's two screws there. So this piece was remade at one time, and it was broken out of the casting. And you've seen the, the braze repair of the bore. But uh, if I can kind of... You can see that this whole handle piece was broke out and added in and they did such a good job you know you can see the seam here so I think that this thing was bored a little bit bigger than it was initially from uh, Colchester this is probably nominal inch and an eighth with some clearance and then this is really close to inch and an eighth so uh, this thing has seen some uh, abuse. So that's why I'm going to make this out of bronze to um, allow the gears to mesh not as t tight as they currently mesh. Because it's just not going to work. Okay, put that down. So this yellow thing, I know, uh, that prevents the half nuts for being engaged. Let me back up here. Back on my stool. It prevents the half nuts from being engaged. Now, okay. So to catch you guys back up on this, I ground the cast iron angle bracket where I could see the, the little threads were hitting. Um, just took it with a Dremel and, and blended that just just barely so the, the witness marks from the, the lead screw having rubbed just barely disappear. So that's good clearance. And uh, 
and kind of kind of show you. So there's the handle. If we can get both in the shot. You see how beautiful, beautifully they go up and down. I mean this thing, and I was astounded in my last video, I, I just put this up so it doesn't interfere. Gravity being what it is. So, soldering that shim of brass on here and tightening this this uh, half nut up so it doesn't have the shake. There's a, a thou or three of clearance in there on the ends, but not uh, not a lot. This thing works so fabulous. I can't even tell you. I know this is blocking my shot here. Okay. So you guys are noticing this little thing. What's that? Put this down. Better shot. So what this does... Okay. So that's disengaged. And that's engaged. And you can see there's a ball detent. There's a, a spring and a ball inside the handle. You can kind of see. It's going to click. Clicks in there. And there's one up top. Here, click in. So at the bottom, where the half nuts are fully retracted, at the bottom, the half nuts are, let me kind of back up and show you, re retracted. Where they sit, um, that's the spring I put in there is almost fully compressed, but not quite. But where they're actually stopping is that thing I was talking about grinding out. There's a little shelf in there um, that stops it from going down any further. And maybe remember I was hemming and hawing. I was saying maybe I'll grind it out the Dremel. But that little piece of casting. I mean, other than the cam. Um, well, no, it, it could come out of the cam. It could come out of the cam. So that little shelf in there prevents it from coming down, well, actually up. So, so that's in the disengaged position. And you can see, to prevent the cam from going too far, that's what that deal is. So there is retracted, there is engaged, and to prevent the cam from going too far, so if I go f further that way, the, uh, the cam roller will drop out of the cam slot. But if I go this way, I'm in the, uh, the sweet spot of the cam there where the cam is like almost horizontal. So there, there as you can, you can kind of see, there's the smiley face. The cam is right in the mid position, like right there. And it over travels just a skosh, but it's like top dead center. The, the, the piece, um, the half nut's not really moving. So there's like your, de your dead center, and then the cam starts retracting down, up, 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 and there's dead center, dead center, dead center, dead center. Did I say that right? Up. Alright, that's as high as it goes, that's dead center. So, so, so that, I can't reach it. That piece keeps it from going too far. And I'll show you. Christmas tree, what that is. So, that's a split collar. And a piece of quarter inch bar stock. Pencil rod, whatever you want to call it. So you, you can probably see the split and the lighting's probably not so great. Um, let's see. So there's the split. 
and uh, I brazed, I drilled a hole, and I brazed into the hole that piece of quarter inch pencil rod. Okay? So that's what that is. That's a clamp collar. And that works pretty darn good. So that, and I was grinding. I was grinding on there. I had a different. I've been trying to figure this out, and I was going to grind a place for it to, to sit. Um, but it ends up being there, so I I think that's fine. So the reason you see a flat on the shaft, it's it's so this thing. So see how that dropped in there? When this is held down. Um, I think it gets hit somewhere on the rocker box. It hits, I think, there or there, depending on which position it's in. That keeps it down. That prevents this lever from being thrown. And see it, see how it raises up, it rises up? If the rocker box is engaged in either, um, longitudinal feed or cross feed, it, it, you can see the paint is worn off, it hits it. So when I engage the lever for the half nuts, see how that raises up? That's, if you hold that down, that cam, that notch in the lever blocks it. So that's what that, that notch or that flat, I guess you'd call it, is for. So, um, that's uh, disengaged, yeah, disengaged, and then engaged, it hits there. And I could actually cut this off, you know, I could cut it right there. But I bent this thing a, a couple different ways. I bent this. This was originally pointing sideways, and I originally had it there, okay? Uh, you had it clamped there, and that rod actually came up and poked the side of the apron wall. And that worked, that was my original concept. And that worked well, except when you disengaged it, it would fold, it would fold up into here, and it wouldn't touch the gear. Um, it had some clearance there, but when I swung the rocker box over, it hit the side of the rocker box when it was engaged in the uh, cross feed there. So, uh, it didn't work there. It, it, it hit the side just fine, but it got in the way of the rocker box. So then I says, okay, I got clearance there, and it was going sideways, uh, like I said, but then I bent it over. And it, that's kind of where it was going, was where that I filed that actually, with a rat tail file. But then it was hitting that nut, okay? So now, uh, there's plenty of clearance around that nut. I mean, I'm far away from that hex nut. Plenty of clearance. So you can see what I was running up against. So then I said, let's just turn it sideways. And instead of going over and coming back and hitting there, yeah, it used to go over and then back. And it was hitting that nut. So I said, let's just turn the whole piece, straighten it out. So you heat it red with the torch and then you just squish it flat with the vise and it's good back to normal. Then you're not going over as far. Once I took that bend out of it, and that, that little zigzag, then uh, to get to my destination, I got to rotate it more and then clamp it. So therefore, it doesn't come over um, when it's in the uh, retracted home position. So that worked out super, super well. You can hear the action is crisp. The clicking from the ball detent and Actually, when the other ball detent uh, clicks in, is simultaneously when it hits the 
the protrusion there in the casting. Sweet, 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 sweet. I love it. So that's what I've been working on. So like I say, two things. Modify that um, detent plunger. Or actually, not modify, but make it out of uh, aluminum bronze. And these are the spacers. I got to set them up on this uh, uh, power feed shaft. So when it's the handle's aligned with that slot, this thing is spaced over, and it kind of sets the distance for you to drop in the slot. Um, and I still need to make a bracket for the face of this out of just flat bar that comes down, over, and up to those two, so to limit how much that this can fall down when the handle's in there, which I took off, which is there. So. I know I'm throwing a lot at you guys, but long and short of the story this week is uh, the new Union Chuck, we covered that and where I'm going to use it in my grinders and how the chucks work and that was a little tangent. The half nuts are working fabulous and I got my travel stop for the limit. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. So uh, yeah, um, the apron for the Colchester is coming along wonderfully. Um, so the next thing, like I said, is to make that detent plunger out of bronze, you fit that up, and I'll just keep turning the diameter until it clicks in the gears mesh uh, with the proper amount of running clearance. Alright, till next time, this has been Doozer's Shop.